all. This is Dr. Mobin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So there is another uh, talk that is important for long COVID, and that is why is it important to understand if you have anti-ACE2 antibodies? The reason is a few days ago, one of the uh, long COVID patient, actually vaccine injured patient, said that she requested her doctor to test for NTS2 antibodies and doctor said, not necessary because I do not know what to do with that information. Fair enough, at least the doctor was uh, uh, open for what their position was. And I think it is important to understand why NTS2 antibodies are important. First of all, I don't think anyone here in the U.S. does that for general public. There are NTAs2 type antibody tests for research labs. However, there is a company called Celltrend, and I have no relationship with them, no commercial relationship. I tried to have them on this show a couple of times, reached out to them. They said, yes, we would love to, and then they would just not respond. So that is all my relationship with them is. And they have a lab, they have an antibody panel that includes anti-ACE2 antibodies. And someone was asking me that, how do we get that test done? So the company's name is Celltrend. They are in Germany. So what you do is they have a instruction set on their site. And the general pr procedure is, and I asked this procedure from Sean Berkowitz because he has gotten it and his interviews are present here on this channel. So what you do is you call a phlebotomist who will come to your home, draw your blood, take it to their lab and spin it for the 10 minutes, 2400 RPM, then prepare it and bring it back to you. You can then label it and send it to Germany where they would do the testing. Then they would ask you to pay via uh, wire and once they, you have paid they would send you the results so that is a pr procedure the question now that i want to tackle is what is the value of doing that why should we do that so let's start <coughs> excuse me I'm so sorry let's start so first of all, here are the links. This is drbean.com. This is a one-time payment of $67. This is actually only for YouTube um, viewers, the ones who are watching now. And there is no recurrence in this payment and you get access to all the lectures on Dr. Bean. Then here is the an important um, uh, article that we'll look into. This is another important article that we'll see in our discussion. And then there are some more articles. This is a study that I have discussed in detail. This is by Dr. William Murphy of, uh, I believe, UC Sacramento. I have actually gone to meet him there as well. A possible role of anti idiotype antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. So what is the point of this all? Let's first discuss it, then I'll draw it as well. The spike protein is a long chain of amino acids. ACE2 enzyme also has a structure, a shape. The spike protein itself, let me actually start drawing too. The spike protein itself has, let me get my pen. So the spike protein has S1 part and then S2 part, wrote it wrong, S2, S1. And then it has receptor binding domain or RBD. And then it has, Within the receptor binding domain, it has receptor binding motif, RBM. And we've been talking about it for a long time. This RBM on a cell that has ACE2 receptor, RBM is the one that helps bind there. So if I make a spike protein, RBM is what binds. So the question is, imagine we have anti-ACE2 antibody. And how is that produced? Let, let me use... This, um, 
this diagram from Dr. William Murphy. So if I go in here and open up this diagram, so imagine this is the virus, or you can see the, the spike of it as a vaccine, vaccine or virus. And what happens is that we produce this antibody one is produced that can attach to the spike protein. Then if you see here, there is another antibody called this antibody 2, AB2, that is produced against AB1, not the spike protein, but against AB1. So this is a, the antibody 1 was a mirror to spike protein, but important thing is spike protein has thousands of amino acids, and antibody would have anywhere from 5, 7 to 12 amino acids. So of course, there is a difference in their in their sizes. So you could say that, hey, spike protein can bind with ACE2, but a 7, 8 amino acid long antibody cannot. But that's what I'm going to answer. So here, antibody 1 is connected to one part of the spike protein. Then we make another antibody that binds to antibody 1. This is called anti-idiotype antibody. And I've done these discussions in detail. Now this, if you see here, this anti-idiotype antibody or antibody 2 down here is binding with ACE2. So then the question will become why there is a huge size difference with these. So let's talk about that. So what happens is this receptor binding domain is actually about 68 amino acids long. It is not thousands of amino acids. It is 68 amino acids long. So that kind of reduces the size that is used to bind with ACE2. Secondly, even with the 68 amino acids, they do not bind with ACE2 in a linear fashion. It's not that they're all laid out straight. And so they all bind straight to the ACE2. Instead, the spike proteins RBM, and I'll show you the diagram of that in a second. The RBM is a convoluted protein that makes a three-dimensional structure. So the actual conformed, conformed meaning the shaped, three-dimensionally shaped structure, the actual structure that comes in contact with ACE2 is actually a smaller size. That means if we produce an antibody against this part of the receptor binding uh, motif of the spike protein. Then we make another antibody against that antibody. The new antibody has a greater chance or a good chance to connect with ACE2 and bind with it. The sizes differences are not huge. And let me now show you a diagram of the spike protein. So if I go in here and open up this guy. So see this one. Here, this green one is ACE2. This area here is the receptor binding domain. The red part is receptor binding motif. And if you see here, this is the receptor binding motif is 68 amino acids long. But do you see how it is coiled and it is in the form of a 3D structure? So here on the end terminal of ACE2, here it is bound to ACE2. And then this is the part that is exposed to ACE2, not the whole receptor binding motif. This is an important concept. If you see here as well, it's a similar thing. This green one is ACE2. Here, the red thing is receptor binding motif. They are connected with the ACE2 here on the N terminal, and then a smaller part is exposed. Now, this smaller part is small enough that there could be an antibody that is similar to this and will be able to bind to ACE2. So, if I have clarified that it is possible that an antibody, anti-idiotype antibody for receptor binding motif is going to be able to bind to ACE2, then the rest of the discussion is very simple. Why is that simple? I have done a talk. The title is How Spike Protein Causes Damage or Endotheliitis. That can be, the spike protein can be replaced there with anti-idiotype antibody. 
what I mean by that is this. It is not necessary that if somebody who has long COVID or vaccine injury, that they always have a resident virus hiding somewhere, or they always have messenger RNA continuously producing spike protein somewhere. Actually, their body could be in an autoimmune disorder where the body is producing autoantibodies that are continuously being produced and going and attaching with ACE2, like spike protein may bind. So meaning the patient is making their own partial receptor binding motif. And once it binds with the ACE2 here, once it binds with the ACE2, that antibody, which I've made here as well, then, so let me bring this in front of us. So once that receptor binding motif, instead of that, the spike protein has bound with ACE2, all the rest of the problems are actually very evident. For example, we know that if this is an endothelial cell, then the enols, I did this discussion a few days ago, so I think I do not need to repeat it, but the, the endothelial nitric oxide synthase enzyme, enols, will become down-regulated. When the enols is down-regulated, then the SOD or superoxide dismutase enzyme is dis, uh, down-regulated as well. That means this cell is going to start producing a lot of reactive oxygen species that is going to damage this cell and the things around Reactive oxygen species damage will cause local inflammation of the endothelium. Now, remember, we are producing this inflammation not by the spike protein, but in, instead by the autoimmune autoantibodies. Similarly, when the ENOS is downregulated and SOD is downregulated, then what happens is as the nitric oxide is not being produced, then the blood vessel becomes constricted. When the blood vessel is constricted, then there is a problem with the blood pressure, there is a problem with the blood flow, there is a problem with hypoxia, and there is even going to be tendency for clotting because the blood vessel is narrow and the blood cells are pushed together with each other. Blood flow is slow. Then we also know that nitric oxide in the blood vessel, let me bring myself here, nitric oxide in the blood vessel from the endothelial cell, when that nitric oxide is released in the blood vessel, its job is to go and prevent the, the platelets from binding with each other. It kind of separates them or it keeps them separate. It prevents aggregation of platelets. So when the nitric oxide production is less, not only vessels are constricted, but within the vessel, the platelets are going to aggregate with each other. So keep thinking about this in terms of autoantibodies, not just in terms of spike protein. That means vaccine injury or long COVID could be suffering with this problem. And this problem is more possible than a resident virus for years or a resident messenger RNA producing spike for years. That is less possible. This is more possible. Autoimmune diseases are common. And I explained in the last lecture how autoimmune diseases can appear after the continuous infection and inflammation. Okay. The other thing is when the enos is reduced in the endothelial cell, then what happens is that the endothelial cells start expressing on its surface what we say cell adhesion molecules or CAMs. ICAMs, intercellular adhesion molecules. These adhesion molecules function is to capture the white blood cells that are traveling in the blood vessel, in the, in the fluid, like little whales that are going. They capture them and stop them. And when the, when the immune cells are stopped, they would start causing local inflammation. Then on top of this, this is something that spike protein cannot do. And that is when the antibody is attached with the ACE2, local complement activation would occur because of the antibody-antigen complex, which will cause local inflammation as well, which would even cause local destruction of the cell, whatever cell it is, in this case, endothelium. Clotting possibility, reduced blood flow, reduced, uh, incorrect, increased blood pressure, reduced oxygen supply, reduced nutritional supply, local hypoxia, accumulation of trash in the area where the blood flow is reduced, damage to the endothelium itself, 
all of that is possible just with the anti ACE2 antibodies. And I have not yet discussed the anti ACE2 antibodies causing ACE2 dysregulation, causing ACE1 to be more dominant in its action because ACE2 is not working, which is an inflammatory state. ACE1 causes pro inflammatory work and vasoconstriction because of the angiotensin 2. And ACE2 converts angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7. And when ACE2 is not functioning correctly, then angiotensin 1 to 7 is not produced, which is vasodilator and anti-inflammatory. So the whole body gets into an inflammatory state and high blood pressure state, or I would say fluctuating blood pressure state with endotheliitis with local hypoxia for example if that is happening to the brain then the brain fog and other neurological symptoms would appear so for a doctor to understand why to do anti-ace 2 is very important because once they have done it it's not an autoimmune disease protection they don't have to just use steroids or they don't have to just use let's say hydroxychloroquine for this kind of antibody that binds with ace 2 they have to help handle the immune mechanisms, plus they have to handle angiotensin 1 and 2 imbalance mechanism, plus they have to handle clotting mechanism, plus they have to handle the hypoxic mechanisms. There are so many more things to treat than just to treat the autoimmune effect or inflammatory effects. This is why it is important to understand what are the levels of anti-ACE2, if it is anti-ACE2 at all or not. If it is anti-ACE2, then all of these things and more become valid and to be looked at. If it is not anti-ACE2, then you have ruled out an important aspect of continuous inflammation. So that is a discussion. I hope it makes sense. Um, let's see some questions here. Uh, Augie says, will the FLCCC protocol still be viable? I think it would be viable, especially there is hydroxychloroquine in there. Plus, there will be anti-clotting that is needed, which is also in there. Plus, there would be uh, mitochondrial rehabilitation that is needed because whenever there is less nutrition and less oxygen, mitochondria is going to get damaged. So that is also helped by the protocol. And I think they're going to use methylene blue as well very soon. So there are yes, FLCCC protocol is a good place to start. Okay, now let's see. Yes, absolutely, Krista. Will autophagy help? Yes, because autophagy would help clear out the immune cells. Plus, it would help reduce the inflammation. But we still have to figure out where in the immune system is the dysregulation. One part of that is to know if there are autoantibodies, the auto anti-ACE2 antibodies or not. So I it baffles my mind if a provider says, I don't need to do anti-ACE2, what would I do with that? Because it imagine if I as a doctor say, you know what, I don't need to know anti-ACE2 because if these are present, there's going to be an autoimmune component and I'm already managing the autoimmune components. No, but you have to then make sure that the clotting is happening because that if you're scratching your head saying, why is this person clotting? Why are their D-dimers increased? Or why their blood just keeps clotting? I cannot draw their blood. If you think, why do they have neurological symptoms? Why do they have local hypoxia going on? Then all of those things can be explained by this. So anyways, this is why it is important. Augie says, is niacin flush a card form of autophagy? I do not know. I'll have to look into this. Old school says we need specially trained doctors, providers for long COVID. I actually believe that, yes, you are correct. And there needs to be a new speciality. Sometimes I feel that I should actually create a separate set of instructions sets or a, or a Zoom call every week to start helping doctors understand these mechanisms or be aware of them. It's not that they do not understand them. They're just so busy, they don't look at them. But I also do not know if there is a value where will doctors providers like to hear these things or not so colombian bean says can you explain the me mechanism of methylene blue yes yeah, so very quickly methylene blue restores 
the complex four of electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation in within the mitochondria that improves oxygen consumption and that reduces reactive oxygen species production plus that makes the mitochondria healthier a healthy mitochondria that is using correctly the oxygen is producing less reactive oxygen species and is producing correct amount of ATP will immediately work on the cell to restore the cell towards normalcy. Otherwise, a cell that is getting stress signals from a mitochondria, that cell would start becoming ready to die. And for the medical providers, medical students, medical doctors, providers, here is what happens. Our mitochondria is a has a charged membrane. And the health of mitochondria is assessed by how charged the membrane is. Just like the health of a normal cell is assessed by MHC1 present on it and mica absent from it, right? That is how we know that the cell is healthy. By we, I mean our immune system knows that. Similarly, within the cell, a cell, imagine I am a cell and I have mitochondria in me. I will know I am healthy if my mitochondria is healthy. And mitochondria health is known if the mitochondria has good membrane potential on it or charge on it. And how do we know if it has a charge? There is a protein within the cell that is called pink protein. It's, the name is pink. There's a protein called pink protein. That pink protein keeps depositing on the surface of the mitochondria. Its job is to deposit on it. Imagine there is dust in the environment that keeps settling on the surfaces. So when the pink protein settles on the mitochondria, if mitochondria is charged, then it removes the pink proteins. It does not let it be there. And that is how the system, the cell knows that my mitochondria is, is healthy. When mitochondria becomes damaged because of ischemia, because of low blood pressure, low blood flow, because of accumulation of acidic environment, it, because it cannot, the blood flow is less and the, the nutrients and the waste products are not, waste products are not cleared out, nutrients are not brought in correctly. Then what happens is the damage of the mitochondria reduces the membrane potential of the mitochondria and the pink protein can now continue to accumulate on it. This is like snow that's, or dust starts settling on the mitochondria. When that happens, the ubiquitins in the system, the markers of death, the, these are separate proteins. They're just looking around to say, do I need to destroy something? And as soon as they see a mitochondria buried under pink protein, they say this mitochondria need to be destroyed. They go and put a flag on it. They say ubiquitinate that. And that... Uh, Long story short, with FLCCC YouTube channel, I have discussed these things in detail over there. So, once the mitochondria is marked for death, then mitophagy occurs. Mitophagy is the process of killing the mitochondria. If mitophagy is done correctly, then it is actually a healthy thing. But if it is done abnormally, then the mitochondria will be destroyed, which in turn causes the cell to be destroyed because there is no energy production and stuff like that. Methylene blue restores the mitochondrial internal function to allow the membrane potential to become restored in the membrane, and then that allows the cell to have ATP plus healthy mitochondria. Cell turns off its signals to die because it says my mitochondria is working fine. My powerhouses are okay. I don't need to die. So it turns off apoptotic signals. It turns off ubiquitination of the mitochondria and the cell becomes healthy, especially in the case of the brain tissue where neuronal degeneration or death is really bad. So that is why if there is a patient who has after vaccine or long COVID neuronal issues, they must look at their mitochondrial health. They must look at their possibility of improving with methylene blue, of course, with their doctor's advice and doctor's supervision. So I hope this makes sense. Luke says, with HCQ used in other autoimmune disorders, what about the use of other drugs such as 
so correct SCQ is a generic helper for the anti-inflammatory system because it turns off the inflammatory pathways any other drug you'll have to see if that would help reset as you've written the inflammatory pathway or not okay so <laughs> DDS says methylene blue is when Dr. Bean had the blue hair. Yes. All right. So, so I so Paul, what happened was the new art. What happened was two, three days ago, my Wacom tablet broke. And so I lost my drawing system. So I got I had another tablet lying around, which is Huion tablet. So I started using this Huion tablet. But the problem is Huion tablet does not work with my previous software, drawing software. So either I had, I had to go buy a new Wacom tablet, and that is three dollars $4,000. I want to have the good one. Or I just figure out how to work with Huion. So I started using Huion, and I started using a different software. And because of that, the drawings are different. So um, Janet says, can the brain repair itself without meds? Depends upon what is the damage and can it, you know, brain has astrocytes and an anti-inflammatory system, so they try to repair, but sometimes it cannot and it needs help. Interestingly, when methylene blue is given in 0.4 to 5, 5 milligram per kilogram body weight, low level, low level methylene blue, high level methylene blue is actually damaging. Low dose methylene blue, when given systemically, meaning orally, for example, it helps because it has a propensity to go and enter the neuronal tissue and help the mitochondria there. Casey says, so can COVID trigger thyroid? I yes. So if it triggers autoimmune activity, either through anti-nuclear antibodies or through the uh, anti-ACE2 antibodies, then of course, autoimmune diseases would occur. Okay, so words word says, do you need a script for methylene blue? So I believe it is a prescription drug, although someone sent me a link today where it said, what was the link? The link was, and again, it's not, I'm not advising anyone. It was called Just Blue. So this is some company that offers methylene blue. I do not know if that is uh, what uh, concentration and uh, over the counter or prescription. So um, I hope that this makes sense. We will be on for our walk tomorrow morning. Happy long weekend. Happy Veterans Day. Tomorrow morning, we'll do our walk at 7 o'clock. And then we'll go from there. Please do me a favor. If you're suffering from long COVID or vaccine injury, and if it is there for a longer time, ANA titers and um, NTAs2 is very useful to know. All right. With this, there are there are links in the description. If you would like to support this work, you can buy Dr. Bean's access for a very low price, or you can buy me a coffee. You can use PayPal. You can become part of Substack. You can become part of this YouTube channel, and so on. So with this, have a nice weekend. I just am seeing if there are any questions. Okay, to let go says, is there a Zoom for the walk? Yes. So I had uh, published that Zoom on Discord, and I published that on Patreon as well. Uh, but yes, there is a Zoom for that. John, you're very welcome. Saw you for after some time. Hopefully, you're doing good. And Colombian bean says great talks thank you I have to do I have to talk about vaccines and their effects I have to talk about vaccines and their side effects I have to talk about long COVID then I have to talk about immunology the book I'm writing and the Dr. Bean so 
these talks just come in various waves, but I try to do whatever I can. And with this, thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Links in the description if you would like to support this work. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, and share. That also helps. Actually, if you put a comment on it, that helps as well. All right. Bye-bye. I would see you either on Monday or Tuesday. Bye for now.